Tudor Travel Guide here and this month I'm back with an episode of the A to Z of Tudor Places that takes us north of the border into Scotland and so more accurately I should say that this month is an A to Z of Stuart Places in fact this month's location has its origins way back in the early medieval period however it is associated with a short but important period in the life of Mary Queen of Scots and so on account of that this episode makes it into this video series. Today of course we are going to be exploring Inchmahome Priory which is close to Stirling on the south side of the Trossachs National Park and before I begin I particularly like to thank Catherine Vost, who is a local historian who's been visiting Inchmahome since she was a child and has studied the site extensively. Now, Catherine very generously shared with me her knowledge and passion for the place as part of my own exploration of this most idyllic of historic places. Okay, so before we get on to the events that surrounded Mary's arrival at the Priory, let's talk a little more about the history of this particular location. Well, Inchmahome Priory is located on an island in the Lake of Menteith, close to Aberfoyle. In terms of our story in relation to Mary, its geography is highly relevant. It is sited some 15 miles to the west of Stirling Castle, where Mary spent her first five years, by and large. Now, its remote location, deep into the heart of Scotland, made it an ideal refuge for Mary's mother, Marie de Guise, to bring little Mary at a time when the English were pressing for the young queen's hand in marriage. And this is now infamously known as the rough wooing of the Queen of Scots and I will say more on those events shortly. So now back to the Priory. Well the ruins you see today belong to a religious institution that was founded in 1238 by a certain Walter Comyn. Now apologies if I have pronounced that name incorrectly. However he was the fourth Earl of Menteith and the Priory probably was predated by an earlier Christian monastery. But given its isolated and dreamy location, it's easy to see why it had become established as a place of spiritual reflection and worship. And it would remain so for the next 400 years, a peaceful idyll and home to an order of Augustinian black canons, their patrons, benefactors, parishioners, etc. However, with the decline of Catholicism in the 16th century, monastic life slowly but surely began to ebb away. And the heads of religious foundations, such as that at Inchmahome, became appointees of local landowners. And in 1547, John Lord Erskine, later the Earl of Mar, was appointed as such. Now, he also happened to be Mary's guardian and regent of Scotland and it was on account of these connections that Mary was brought to Inchmahome when her safety was threatened by the English incursions across the border. So what about those events which culminated in Mary's flight to Inchmahome? Well, the story begins some four years earlier shortly after the birth of the Scots Queen in December 1542. Still reeling from the crushing defeat by the English at the Battle of Solway Moss, when much of the cream of Scotland's nobility perished, the Scots acquiesced to Henry VIII's petition for the betrothal of little Mary to Henry's then five-year-old son, Edward. Now, if that had been successful, of course, it would have been a powerful dynastic union, replicating the one that Henry VII had successfully arranged between his daughter and Mary's grandfather, James IV. And the Treaty of Greenwich, as it was called, which sought to bind the youngsters together, was finally signed on the 1st of July, 1543. 
Mary was not yet one year old. And although some of the Scottish nobles favoured the union, others, including Mary's mother, who herself was from a powerful noble French family, preferred an alliance with France and the papacy. As a result, a good deal of prevarication ensued on the part of the Scots. And this ultimately ended with the Scottish Parliament rejecting the agreement in December of the same year. Henry was furious at the deceit and he began what would turn out to be an eight-year campaign against the Scots. Now it's this campaign that became known as the Rough Wooing. And although Henry himself died in January 1547, Edward Seymour, then Lord Protector Somerset, continued to press the Scots for their adherence to the treaty. This eventually culminated in the catastrophic slaughter of the Scots army at the Battle of Pinky Clue at Musselburgh, just outside Edinburgh, on the 10th of September 1547. Now, if you want to read what is an horrific eyewitness, eyewitness sorry, account of the battle, which underscores just why Mary's mother was so concerned for her daughter's safety, you can read my blog which accompanies this video. You can find the link above and in the description below. Well, Marie de Guise was at Stirling Castle when she received news of the defeat and possibly even in her presence chamber, which you can still visit today in all its 16th century glory. She was deeply afraid for the safety of her daughter and the possibility that Mary might be captured by English forces. After all, the English army had reached Edinburgh only 30 miles or so away from Stirling. And as a result, it is said that under cover of darkness, little Mary was whisked away from the castle with her mother alongside her. And they were headed westwards to Inchmahome Priory. According to Catherine Vost, Inchmahome was a natural choice, and not only because it was an island sanctuary, but also because its so-called commendator, Robert, master of Erskine, was the son of Mary's guardian, the aforementioned Lord John of Erskine. However, unfortunately for Robert, he had been among the many Scots to die at the Battle of Pinky Clue. But his family connections with the monarchy made Inchmahome the perfect place to retreat to, some 85 miles or so from the battle site itself. So, what can be seen there today and what do we know of the place that Mary and her mother were lodged whilst on the island? Well, if you visit the Priory today, you will find its secluded ruins which still speak of the small scale and intimacy of life at the Priory. As might be expected, the little cluster of buildings comprised the main Priory church with its processional west door at one end and the grand east window at the other. And this, of course, lit once lit the high altar. Cloisters, traditionally, as they usually did, lay to the south of the Priory Church, around which all the conventual buildings were located. Those sited to the east of the cloister today are the most complete and include buildings such as the Chapter House, which has been recently re-roofed. According to Historic Environment Scotland, the Prior's lodgings, where Mary and her mother most likely lodged in the most high-status chambers, were probably located in the cloister's west range at first floor level and possibly above the cellarer's stores. However, somewhat confusingly, in a paper I found on Scottish monasteries by Marilyn Guest, she states, and, and I quote, the prior's lodgings was over the normal part, northern part of the range, with the guest house over the southern cellars, occupying the part of the range not occupied by the cloister walk, end quote. So, 
there does seem to be some disagreement around that point. <sighs> anyway, Mary lived amongst the monks of the Priory for just three weeks far away from the chaos of the battlefield and its bloody and bitter aftermath. And it was according to legend that while staying at Inchmahome Priory, that the four-year-old queen began her formal studies, learning her first Latin, Greek and Italian while on the island. And it's also said that she began to learn how to embroider whilst at Inchmahome and tend the gardens of the Priory. And there are various features on the island that still bear her name today. And these include things like Queen Mary's Bower and Queen Mary's Garden, situated on the southern part of the island. However, I must stress, they are not thought to be associated with Mary directly, just named in honor of this brief moment in time in the already turbulent life of Mary, Queen of Scots. Now you might be asking what happened to Mary after she left Inchmahome. So the court returned to Stirling Castle eventually after that three week period where Mary would spend one final Christmas with her mother in Scotland. And then in February 1548, the little Queen of Scots traveled to Dumbarton Castle to await transport to France and her new destiny as its a Dauphine. In fact, five months later, in the July of the same year, the Scottish Parliament finally agreed to her betrothal to Francois, the Dauphin of France. And finally, after the adverse winds had delayed her departure for some time, the five-year-old Mary and her four companions, the famous Four Marys, set sail for France. And yes, another chapter in the eventful life of Mary, Queen of Scots, was about to be written. And while Mary only remained at the Priory for a fleeting three-week period during the autumn of 1547, it is such a romantic spot to visit that it is definitely worthy of being included on any time traveller's itinerary. So what if you want to visit the Priory? Well, to get there, certainly the nearest city, as I've already mentioned, is Stirling, and certainly public transport as far as Stirling will be relatively straightforward. Personally, I would then recommend picking up a car to head westwards to the Lake of Menteith. Gives you just a little bit more flexibility as you go cross country. And under normal non-COVID circumstances, the Priory is accessible between March and October and there's a Diddy 12-person boat that shuttles visitors back and forth to the island from the port of Menteith on the B8034 just off the A81. However, this year, 2020, on account of COVID-19, just like another incredibly romantic site associated with Mary's story, Loch Leven, Inchmahome is sadly closed and will remain so until the spring of 2021. Do make sure you check out all the latest news and opening times via the Historic Environment Scotland website and I'll put a link to that in the text below this film. So my friends that concludes this month's A to Z of Tudor stroke Stuart places. I hope you've enjoyed exploring a lesser known location and somewhere that you, I hope, can add to your travel itinerary. Now, if you want to hear more about some other pivotal locations associated with Mary, then why not check out my special In the Footsteps of Mary Queen of Scots podcast series, which is running throughout September 2020 we'll be delving into some of the most iconic places in which she lived during her time in Scotland, including Linlithgow Palace, Edinburgh Castle, Holyrood Palace and Stirling Castle. And you'll find a link to my podcast page above. All right, so, well, all that remains for me to say is until our next adventure, it's time for me to time travel. So I'll see you at our next location. Mm -hmm.